In this lecture, we'll be looking at the special senses of hearing and sight, as well as equilibrium. So we're going to start with the special sense of hearing, and we're going to start by looking at the structures involved in the process of hearing. There are quite a lot of structures, actually, that are involved in the processing of sound waves, and they all kind of start at the outer ear. So on this diagram, you can see everything in this region is considered the outer ear. So first we have the auricle. Um, this is sometimes also called the pinna, depending on the text or um, the reference that you're using. And basically it acts as a funnel. It's a big cartilage structure. There's no bone in the ears, or in the outer part of the ear at least. Um, so this cartilage is shaped in such a way that as sound waves enter or are moving through the air, they get basically funneled into the more narrow ear canal. Um, they first enter through this area, which is called the external acoustic medi medis, pardon me, um, or the EAM. And then eventually the outer ear ends at a very tight skin-like structure called the tympanic membrane. Um, tympanic means drum in Latin, so a lot of times this is also just called the, the eardrum. As the sound waves reach the eardrum, it causes that structure to vibrate, just like the top of a drum vibrates when it is struck by a drumstick or a mallet or anything else. Um, when sound waves hit the eardrum, it vibrates. That vibration then causes a kind of chain reaction of structures deep within the ear. So first we get to the middle ear, which on this diagram is going to be kind of this portion from about here to about there. Um, and the middle ear is actually embedded within the bone of the skull and specifically the temporal bone. So this is the part of the skull that surrounds the temporal lobe. And there's a kind of a hollow space within that bone that the middle ear um, fills up. And the middle ear it fills the space with a couple of very, very tiny bones. As a group, those bones are called the auditory ossicles. And there are three. So the first is the outermost bone and it's called the malleus. The second is the incus. And the third is the stapes. Those are all Latin names. Um, actually, they might be Greek, but either way, they're all in other languages. And in English, they translate based on the shape of the bone. So the first is the hammer, the second is the anvil, and the third is the stirrup. So um, for if you zoom in on this picture, or if you look at a larger picture, you'll see those tiny, tiny bones as they fill this little space inside. So as the eardrum vibrates, it hits the hammer. The hammer then hits the anvil. The anvil finally hits the stirrup. And those vibrations, each vibration of each bone gets more and more um, significant. It gets amplified until eventually there's kind of a pounding by that stirrup on the first structure of the inner ear called the oval window. And that's because it's another very thin uh, membrane and it's in the shape of an oval. So on the back side of um, the oval window is the inner ear, which we'll talk about next. You can see down in this region of the picture, there is a hollow space that is called the auditory tube or the eustachian tube. That actually connects the middle ear to the nasal cavity. We've lost some text down here, but it helps to maintain air pressure within um, both the ear and the nasal cavity. Um, so sometimes when you've got a cold, for example, or you've got um, allergies and you've got a bunch of congestion in your sinus cavities, you'll feel kind of itchiness in your ears or your ears will feel congested. That's because of um, fluid buildup in the eustachian tube. And so it actually can kind of push on the middle ear, which is why you feel that sensation. So to continue with the inner ear, 
we have um, a few more structures, and I'm going to simplify these pretty significantly. There's quite a bit more going on here, but um, for the sake of understanding it more easily, we're going to simplify. So the inner ear has a very complicated system called the labyrinth, and this is a bunch of tubes that are essentially hollow and filled with different kinds of fluids. Some of the fluids are very viscous, so they're pretty thick, more like motor oil, and some of them are very, um, very thin in consistency, so they flow more easily. Each fluid has kind of a particular job and a particular home. Um, so we've got at the base of the inner ear, we have this shell-shaped structure kind of right here. I don't really want to cover up over it, but it's that purple kind of um, cinnamon roll looking structure. That's called the cochlea. And the cochlea is this kind of winding tube system that ha is lined with different length hairs. And the hairs move um, whenever the fluid that fills those hollow spaces move. So each different sound frequency um, and each different pitch, for example, different note of sound shifts the hairs differently. And so depending on which hair bends, um, that imagine that we've got these hair cells here and some are very, very tall and some are very short and they have all these different um, properties, but as they shift, so let's say a sound wave comes in and it hits these um, red hair cells and the hair cells begin to bend like this. That sends an impulse down the hair cell and into um, auditory receptors and those auditory receptors eventually hit the auditory nerve or send an impulse to the auditory nerve and that impulse tells the brain what frequencies of notes we're hearing. Um, the brain is capable of processing multiple sound waves at a time. So if you're hearing, let's say, a piece by a symphony, there's all kinds of different notes happening depending on which instruments, and some of them are louder than others, and some of them are soft. The brain is processing all of that based on which hairs bend and the degree to which they bend. Um, the more stimulation that the hairs get, so the stronger the sound waves, the louder the brain interprets that music as being. At this point, we are also going to talk about equilibrium because within the inner ear, there are a couple of other structures that are very strongly involved with the process of equilibrium. So what that means is equilibrium is your body's sense of balance. And in terms of um, sensory information, we have kind of two processes happening together. They're called static equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium. So static equilibrium is your body's ability to maintain its posture and position. And primarily we're looking at that in terms of the head. Your brain um, detects what the head is doing most strongly to provide information about the overall um, environment that the body happens to be in. So in the inner ear between the cochlea, remember the cochlea was our little kind of cinnamon shaped structure or cinnamon roll shaped structure. There are these three um, other structures called the semicircular canals and they look sort of like that. There are three hoops. One is laying on the X axis, one is laying on the Y axis of the inner ear, and the third is laying on what would be the Z axis or the diagonal. And they're also filled with fluid. So whenever the head moves, the fluid within those canals moves as well. And that movement of the hair of the fluid moves tiny little hairs within the semicircular canals. And as those hairs bend, so if, for example, if you lean over and um, lean your head down to tie your shoe, the fluid within the semicircular canals will bend in that same direction and it tells the body, it tells the brain through the vestibular nerve which way the head is moving and then that information can go to the cerebellum to help um, adjust accordingly and keep the body in proper posture and position so that you don't for example, suddenly tumble over onto your face.
The other type of equilibrium is called dynamic equilibrium. And this is looking at not so much changes in just the head, but changes in the overall body position. So um, as the body moves, the fluid in the canals moves differently as well. If the head stays perfectly still as the body moves, then there's very little change in the um, bending of the fluid or the movement of the fluid and the bending of the hairs within the semicircular canals. But if there is lots of movement, say jumping on a trampoline, for example, then those semicircular canals are doing lots of adjustment, right? The hairs are moving pretty significantly, and so the brain is processing that as lots of movement. Um, the thing that's interesting about this is particularly with dynamic equilibrium, the cerebellum re requires a lot of information from other senses as well. And primarily, we're looking for sight information and we're looking for muscle um, like receptors to tell the body when the muscles are contracting and how the, the different body parts are moving. All of that information is getting sent back to the cerebellum for adjustment. A lot of times though, the body will be detecting movement. So let's say you are riding in a car. Holy cow. Okay. It's going to be a car. It's going to be a truck. Why not? So you're riding in a truck and what your eyes are seeing here is you riding in your truck. The eyes are seeing that there is movement, right? Because trees are passing you by, um, other cars are passing you by, all of that is happening. And so your eyes are communicating to the brain movement, but the head isn't really moving. The head is sitting stationary all the time. And the body isn't really moving, but there are receptors in the muscles that feel the vibration of the road. And so they're communicating that information back to the cerebellum saying there's some movement happening here. And the eyes are saying there's movement happening here, but the semicircular canals are saying, no, there's not. The head is perfectly stable. The body is not moving. And all of that conflicting information causes motion sickness. Some people can handle that better than others, and some people it becomes very difficult for the brain to process all of that information, and it ends up um, causing nausea, sometimes vomiting, things of that nature. Okay, our final sense in this lecture is going to be about sight. At this point, I'm gonna suggest to you that you pause the video and write down these terms um, and use the diagram up here as reference so you can kind of get familiar with where these different parts are and then once you have written them down then restart the video so that you can and I'll explain to you how light enters the eye. Okay so now you've seen all of the kind of major structures of the eye itself and what they do. The processing of light entering the eye this is just one example but as the light is changing, the amount of light available to the eye is changing, the muscles around the pupil are also adjusting accordingly. So as if, let's say you're in a very, very bright environment, um, you know, the height of summer in the middle of the day, that is more light than the eye really needs to process the visual information around. So the pupil will contract the muscles around it will contract so that less light is entering the eye. When you're in a dim environment, for example, let's say it's evening time or nighttime, then the pupil will expand as the muscles around it relax so that it, we can get even more light into the eye to allow for um, processing of visual images. Once that light enters the eye, it gets bent a couple of times. You might remember from biology or from chemistry that light moves in a straight line. It moves in waves, but those waves travel in a straight line. And they will continue in a straight line until and if they strike an object. That's exactly what happens when light enters the eye. So imagine that these red lines in this diagram are light rays. They are moving toward the eye, and when they hit, the very first they hit, the cornea, which is the kind of clear layer on the outside of the eye, but the cornea is solid. So light rays are coming through this gaseous environment, right through the atmosphere, and then they hit the solid part of the cornea. That causes them to bend. 
So imagine these are the light rays. The light rays then bend as they hit that solid object. Then they bend again when they move from the cornea past the pupil, which is the opening, into the watery fluid, the aqueous humor that's inside the eyeball. So now they bend again because they're moving through a different type of object. And then finally they hit the lens, which is again a solid, and so they are bent a third time. All of that bending causes the light rays to eventually become focused at one location. That location is along the very back portion of the eye, I guess the posterior portion of the eye, and it is focused on photoreceptors that are built into the retina. If the eye is shaped properly, if it is just the right roundness and the lens is just the right shape and the cornea is just the right thickness, then the image should be focused perfectly like you see here where you have just one little pinpoint. And so that one little pinpoint is focusing all of the light energy into that one area and then it can be carried back along the optic nerve to the optic chiasm and then eventually to the optic um, or the visual cortex within the occipital lobe. However, there are times when the eyeball is not perfectly roundly shaped. Let's say it's shaped more like a football or it's shaped more like an egg or the lens itself is not quite shaped properly. And so then what happens is we get these images where the light rays come in and they bend, but they focus too close to the... Um, they focus short of the retina. Instead of being right back here, now they're focused right here, which makes the image blurry. Or sometimes they bend and they never get to a focus point because the eye is too short. So again, you get a blurry image. Those conditions are called nearsighted or farsighted, depending on uh, which way the eye is misshapen. If we assume that the shape of the eyeball is just right, so that the image is focused perfectly on the back of the or the, pardon me, on the retina at the back of the eye, then we have two kinds of photoreceptors that are collecting that light information. The first type of cell is called a rod, and it allows the vision for black and white, um, shading, shadow, brightness, all of those things. Humans have exactly one rod cell, um, and they're very similar from person to person. They're very, very sensitive, and so they work well in all kinds of light. The second type of photoreceptor cell is called a cone, and here's how I remember that cones provide color because they both start with C-O, cones and color. So cones provide um, sharpness in vision. They get, you know, provide the sharp edges and the crisp images, and they also provide for the color variations that we see. At the very, very center of the retina um, is a spot called the foveala centralis. In this part of the retina, so imagine this is the retina here, right, and this is the, the optic nerve is going to eventually be coming out back here. So the fovea centralis, let's say, is this portion. It has no rods, but it has very densely packed cone cells, so it provides for really good color vision and very, very sharp pictures. If something is very far away or your brain is really trying to focus on it, then the eyeball position will shift so that that object, um, the rays of light from that object are bent specifically onto the foveala centralis so that we get maximum visual acuity and the best possible image for the brain to process. Um, where the optic nerve leaves the eye, so it attaches, um, it's a part of a continuous layer here called the sclera, there are no receptor cells there because there is the optic nerve is leaving that space, so there's nowhere for the cells to be. There's just kind of an opening. That is what leads to the concept we call the blind spot. So there's no, any light rays that hit that particular part of your retina are not received in any way. They're not processed by the brain. And so every picture that we see, every view we have of the world has little parts that are missing because they're, that those light rays weren't absorbed and therefore can't be processed. But our brains are really good at saying, huh, 
okay, if we've got the rest of this picture um, is very obvious, then it fills in the details that are likely to be there. Do we know if they're right? Not always, but we can make a pretty good assumption that they are. And then finally, as information is heading down the optic nerve, it gets to the optic chiasma, which we talked about quite a bit in the last unit when we looked at sheep brain dissection. And you can see here where the information from different sides of our vision, kind of the lefternmost side of our visual field and the right side over here, um, those bits of information travel on different parts of the optic nerve. They combine at the optic chiasma and then they get processed in their entirety on both sides of the occipital lobe so that we have one really great complete as complete as possible 3D image. So that's it for our very brief look at hearing equilibrium and sight. Make sure you write down some questions, um, finish your summary, and I will see you in class.